Hi everybody, thanks for coming to this breakout session about um, cheering and infant feeding in emergencies where we're going to be talking to you about the front lines of the refugee crisis and some of the activity that's going on um, around our group in Greece uh, working with refugees. So um, as you're probably aware, having seen many um, recent news stories all over the world, wherever you're tuning in from, um, refugees is an enormous problem. There are um, 25.9 million refugees worldwide. Um, the largest group is from Syria, Afghanistan and South Sudan. Um, but as we in America are aware, there are also many refugees on the uh, coming in from the borders um, into the into the North America as well. Um, and I say refugees are a problem, but maybe I should say really that the circumstances that cause refugees are the problem because um, 37,000 people per day flee their homes due to conflict and persecution. So really the onus is on us to help those people rather than worry about um, our worry about our own territories. So um, in terms of um, Athens, it, this is where Athens lies in, in Greece in um, Europe. Um, and as you can see, Greece is in southeastern Europe. And I know there are some of you on there from Greece who will know very well where Greece is, but um, we have people here from all over the world. So I'm just letting everyone know where Greece is. Um, and this is a picture of the Acropolis and it's actually in the snow. Um, but this is the kind of thing that you're used to seeing, you know, the Acropolis and all the islands of Greece. Um, but actually Greece has a very big problem um, in terms of management and um, dealing with refugee populations. It's quite a big problem in the country. Um, the refugees in Greece are coming because of the intense uh, increased conflict in Asia, the Middle East and certain parts of Africa. And they usually come across the land mass or sometimes by sea to Europe, which would be Greece and Italy and Spain are the countries they tend to go to the most. Um, and their goal is to reach Western Europe. They're not really going to Greece, um, but because now the EU borders are pretty closed, many refugees get stuck in Greece and cannot get any further. Um, Greece is already in something of an economic crisis. Um, it's had a huge economic crisis. It's slowly recovering, but there are dysfunctional systems um, and the refugee system is no better. Unfortunately, camps are over capacity. There are shelters that are full. The aid is really backlogged. And the conditions in the camps uh, range from fair to appalling, depending on where the camps are located. So the camps upon the islands are really um, in very bad condition. Um, and also, I would say the number of homeless people on the streets of Athens, um, the refugee population is dramatically increasing as the government tries to close some of the camps, which puts people onto the streets. You can see now, if you move slightly the map, um, where Greece lies in relation to um, the Middle East and North Africa, and this is where the populations come from. There has definitely been a tremendous drop off in the number of refugees coming into Greece because of the COVID epidemic, um, mainly because movement in Turkey was very restricted as it has been all over the world. And so um, it was not easy for the smugglers and the bringing the refugees into Greece to move around in Turkey. So it's been slower last year, but there are still a lot of people in Greece, about 92,000 refugees living in Greece and about half of them living in camps. Um, and as I say, COVID has slowed it, but as um, COVID restrictions go down, we have more refugees coming in this year than last year. Um, and the data is all collected. <laughs> the data are all collected. I wouldn't say all the data are collected, but the data that people choose to collect. Um, it is logged. Um, so UN Refugee Agency or UNHCR keeps data on the arrivals in different European countries all over the world actually. And this is just a sample um, data sheet showing um, the people coming into the southern Mediterranean. I think one of the things that the UNHCR does keep an eye on is the number of dead and missing. This is a fairly perilous journey coming in, especially on the little boats that come across um, fairly some small sea areas and some fairly large sea areas. So um, many people do not make it. Um, and it's a fairly, um, the, the ones that do have major trauma. So it's not, it's not a great situation. To move on to breastfeeding, um, this sad picture is um, from UNICEF. You may have been familiar with this already. It's been around for a while. This is a woman from India who was um, feeding twins and she was told she would not have enough milk 
for two babies. So she breastfed the boy and she formula fed the girl, which later died. And she said, um, if, you, if my picture will help, please use it. Um, so as I have said, the conditions for the refugees coming into Greece are not great. Um, and in these kinds of crises, breastfeeding really becomes a matter of life and death. Um, the WHO, as many of you will know, recommend exclusive breastfeeding for six months. Um, but in countries where we have antibiotics vaccinations, reliable electricity, high levels of literacy, um, formula fed infants are protected against some of the most serious consequence of not breastfeeding. Um, but not so in populations that don't have access to those. And six months exclusivity worldwide, according to the WHO, would save over 850,000 lives per year, most of them in children under six months, and prevent half of all diarrheal diseases and a third of all respiratory infections in children in low and middle income countries. So the WHO is strongly behind universal breastfeeding, although unfortunately it doesn't always happen. If you think about it in the sort of specific terms, um, when you breastfeed versus formula feed during a crisis, um, there are many things that get in the way of formula feeding successfully and safely. So to make the, the formula, you need, you need the formula in the first place. Um, and many places cannot get formula, people can't afford to buy it, etc. Um, and they substitute all sorts of inappropriate things. You need a reliable source of clean water, which is definitely not always the case in the camps, um, in other, other situations like that. You need the facility to boil and sterilize the water before you mix it. Um, you need sterile feeding bottles, which is also extremely difficult if you don't have a reliable source of, of fuel. Um, you need refrigeration. Um, and then you need to actually use the refrigeration if you have it, because as you can imagine, the formula is extremely expensive for people like refugees to purchase. And so if they purchase it and then um, it maybe the baby doesn't finish the bottle, of course, the temptation is to keep that bottle as you go around, not reuse it, throw it, reuse it, sorry, not throw it out. And of course, people do keep it because it's so expensive they don't throw it away if the bottle's not finished and then you also have to be able to read the directions um, sometimes we have illiterate um, families who cannot read at all but more frequently the issue is that uh, you, the, the formula is coming in from all sorts of countries with different languages so we have formula with instructions written in German Spanish Chinese, etc., um, and people cannot read it. Even the people who are managing the camps can't read it. So um, being able to read the directions is very problematic. And then you have to repeat everything to eight to 12 times a day. So you can imagine there's many reasons why formula feeding in crises is really um, a, a potentially tragic situation. Um, of course, breastfeeding needs none of that. You don't no need sterilization, refrigeration, bottles, money, all literacy, or any special diet in order to be able to breastfeed. So just to move more specifically onto the work that we're doing, cheering, as you know, is part of CHIA and CHIA is rooted in academic institution at Boston Medical Center and Boston University. But we have an office in Athens and we have many researchers and volunteers who are willing to work with us. So we decided in 2018 to launch a nonprofit organization in Greece. Um, but we, because of our background and everything, we said, well, let's take a look at the data and what, try to figure out what's the need here. Although it was, <laughs> it was fairly evident, I will say what the need was, but we said, let's have a go and see what, what we can find. So one of the things that we did was we took this um, book, The Infant and Young Child Feeding in Emergencies, which is a very long book, but very accurate. Um, it was created by the Emergency Nutrition Network, and it is supposed to help exactly in these kinds of circumstances when you're operating programs um, in emergencies for that involve women and children um, and all the information in here is WH compliant it's extremely accurate and it's great um, so if you took this book and you sort of operationalized it then you would have um, emergency setups like refugee camps that were doing all the right things around breastfeeding um, and that's what it's there for. So we decided to figure out if it was being used. So we um, went to six camps in the Attica region, which is the area around Athens, to see if anyone was actually using the guidelines. Um, and we also looked at site profiles, which were published, they don't publish these anymore, 
I'm sure there are political reasons why they don't. But at the beginning um, in Greece, there were um, the UNHCR was publishing profiles of every refugee camp. So we looked at the um, site profiles that were being published and regularly updated for the six camps in the Athens area, um, which are six of the biggest camps. And then we performed one on one interviews with the coordinators who were running those camps in those six areas. Um, and what we found um, in terms of the data there were about 6,000 refugees um, in the camps, 38% of whom were children. And although the site profile said that there were mother infant friendly spaces at three of the camps, um, only one of them actually had an operating um, child friendly space at the time. Um, and there was nothing in the site profiles at all about infant feeding in emergencies, which was kind of interesting because that was the official document. Um, and then the real, the real rubber hit the road. Um, not a single field coordinator was aware of the guidelines or anything about infant feeding um, in an emergency policy. Um, none of them had training for anybody around infant feeding in emergencies or any knowledge of the recommendations. Um, women were buying a formula themselves because they got um, a card from the government that gives them so much cash per week to live from. Um, which is a very long story in and of itself. But anyway, they were buying it in the shops, but there the, was not enough money on those cards to be able to feed the baby for the right period of time. Um, and actually that, the reason then and the reason now that most people come to us from the agencies for help is because mothers are constantly asking for formula because they can't afford it. So our conclusion from our little study there was that no, not only are the WHO feeding goals not being met, but they're not even on the radar screen. Um, and actually the reasons for women giving infant formula are modifiable. In other words, people could breastfeed, which <laughs> to be honest, doesn't really seem to be on a lot of radar screens. People come to us all the time saying, can you donate formula to the mothers in this camp? And we're like, what about breastfeeding? And people kind of look at you like, that's not possible. Um, so our conclusion was that really nobody is watching these babies. And that, unfortunately that's true for many other things for the young babies, they're not going to the doctor either for anything. And many of them don't have vaccinations either. So, um, it's a drop in the ocean, but after this, we began to work in camps and shelters offering hands-on help. We did some trainings. Um, I did one last month. We do trainings either online or you know, for directly for different groups that uh, manage camp situations or shelters. Uh, we recruit volunteers and supporters and try to raise some money. Um, and you will notice that Choose Love is the sponsor for this session, and they are the organization that funds cheering on an ongoing basis. And I have to say, we completely rely on Choose Love, and they're a wonderful organization. Um, and we don't have really any funding from anywhere else at the moment. But no other organization except Turing is offering this level of outreach or professional training in Greece right now. I can say that completely confidently for in, in terms of breastfeeding. So the baseline principles that we applied are the same that we would apply um, if we were working at Boston Medical Center. We um, are working in cheer in Mississippi. We, we are ultimately professional um, and we have the same kind of basic principles. So we engage a community, which is peer counselors. Um, we train peer counselors, we pay them, they have insurance. Um, healthcare, everything like that. So that's one of our steps. We also uh, collaborate and engage with other organizations um, and we train the peer counselors from the community. So let's um, hear a little bit about from Pierrette in this next slide. Hello, I'm Pierrette Iaka. I'm from Congo. And I started working for Shering 2019 till today. And I work as peer counselor and breastfeeding advocate. During the group clinic, I told the mama about the importance of breastfeeding for their baby. Because baby needs two breastfeeding exclusive till six months. And I check also the vaccination the babies had and I reminder the mom for next appointment. Working for Shearing is my passion. I like what I am doing to the babies and mom. This is my job. I think um, you would hear that you heard the passion and enthusiasm there in Pierrette's voice. Um, one of the things that we 
do is ensure that, um, you know, we one of the things Greece is aiming for is to ensure that the refugees have um, integration into the community, um, that they work, that they earn their living and that they have an opportunity for growth and development. So that's what we try to do with our peer counsellors. So um, that's another part of the kind of overall strategy for refugee integration that we hope to meet. So uh, going back to some of the practicalities, um, getting into the camps once we had decided that's what we wanted to do is a logistical nightmare. Um, all the camps are run by different agencies uh, that are sort of given contracts by the government. So even like the security at the camp, one camp will have much stricter security than another because the agency that runs it is a different security agency, for example. And um, health is considered to be something that the Greek Ministry of Health is in charge of. So um, no one else is allowed to do healthcare in the camp, even though the camps are so dramatically um, uh, under-resourced. I mean, one of the camps we worked in, Scaramangas, had 3,000 people at one point and one doctor. So you can imagine, especially given the level of morbid morbidity and trauma in the camps, that that is obviously not enough. But the, the rules say that no one else can do healthcare. So we are only in there doing nutrition. Um, and for one of the camps, we go in with this group called Drop in the Ocean, Drop in Your um, sort of work, working with them in, in collaboration because um, that's the only way really to sort of combine forces to get in. Um, so that's how we try to get in. And one of the first things we found when we got into the camp was a lot of sugar. Um, there was actually the first play, first day that my colleague Irini went to Scaramangas and there was a big bowl of sugar in the middle of the room for the moms and the babies. And um, what we found was mothers were coming in with their regular just cow's milk, um, scooping in some sugar and giving that to the baby because they felt that the sugar would give the baby more nutrition and more energy, which of course it does for half an hour and then well you have a problem and you have some very unhealthy babies um women who were not breastfeeding were not feeding formula um they were feeding like i say cow's milk or other things they would give some formula but they didn't have enough money to pay um to pay to give it for the whole month um and they certainly weren't familiar with all the requirements of preparation um, and some nonprofits, not many but some were giving out welcome baby bags that contain formula pacifiers and bottles which of course is against the international code the international code which is 40 years old this week um, and you can see this is actually a baby food on the right hand side this picture you can see it's in well i'd actually know what language it's in it looks to me like it might be in chinese but i don't actually know but anyway um no one in the camp that we were working with could read the instructions on this particular box of baby food um, we also found and i'm afraid this is really widespread that medical professionals like when women give birth in the hospital um, not at one hospital, there's a very brilliant um, baby friendly hospital in Greece called Atikon, which is near to Scaramangas, and they're very good. But many of the other hospitals, um, the professionals were telling mom that um, they, you know, they, their milk wasn't good enough. Um, they would tell the mothers to add extra formula. We had a baby that had kidney failure because the doctor had told the mother to add a lot more formula. Um, I will say these are not all Greek doctors. There's a lot of volunteer agencies out there with very inexperienced doctors too um, and I was in that particular case it was one of those agencies it was not the Greek hospital that put <laughs> too much formula powder into the water um, but there's all these kinds of hazards around um, and we also have um, doctors telling mothers that because they live in not clean places or because they don't have good diets they won't make good milk and you can imagine this is something that women in these traumatic situations unfortunately completely buy into because if somebody says to them you know you're you're living you're too stressed to produce enough milk they're going to say yeah that's true they, you know there's a lot of misinformation around and we found that most of the babies were on track for weight gain but there was a lot of outliers um and I think when well, we haven't really gone in very scientifically and measured the toddlers, we do offer weighing and measuring of older children, but we don't really, we don't have the resources to do it at, at scale. Um, but what I notice is that there's a, the, the parents definitely voice a lot of eating issues around the toddlers. And there are some studies out there showing stunting in refugee camps, which I think might be an issue in Greece as well. So we operate, we have two full-time employees. Um, we have three part-time peer counselors. Um, and then there's a wonderful program in Europe called Erasmus, which sends um, experienced students for three month placements. Um, so we take Erasmus students. It's wonderful that we have um, students and volunteers 
who come for a considerable time, like three months, because it's very difficult and uh, sort of fragmented when people only come for a couple of weeks. So we try not to avoid that. Um, and we do have some students from Boston University who I think are on the a call today, on the conference today. They're going to be coming um, this summer to, and they're getting three month stays. So we have a lot of willing people. We kind of operate at capacity. We we don't take dozens of volunteers. We get a lot of applications, but we just try to keep it a sort of manageable size. These are our peer counsellors in operation. Um, this is Leila, Shaista and Pierre. Shaista has gone on to a different organisation where she's now a translator, but we have a new um, peer counsellor, Farzana, who I haven't got around to putting photos of. Of course, another massive advantage to us of, of the peer counsellors is that they speak the languages because translation is a huge issue. So um, Leila speaks Farsi. Pierrette speaks French and um, Lingala, and then we have Arabic speakers, we have other people that help us out because we need um, constant translation. So here I'm going to just play you um, a little video from Leila, who is going to talk to you about her work with cheering. Hello, my name is Leila. I come from Iran. And uh, I work as a peer counselor with the cheering group in Greek. We work with uh, refugees in camps and shelters, uh, where we check the growth of the babies, measure their length and the weight and baby development. Also, we provide mother with uh, advices on breastfeeding and infant feeding. I like working with cheering because they support mothers with advice on breastfeeding and they check on babies or a regular basis, making the mothers feel happy that they and their babies are getting care and that they have someone to help them when they have worries about breastfeeding and about their children and babies' health. I think the service that sharing offers is very important as we are helping refugees mother and the babies. During our sessions, we encourage mothers to do only breastfeeding in the first six months of their baby's lives. And that is very important because some mothers have wrong ideas about breastfeeding and they think their milk is not good enough for babies uh, so they start giving formula we tell moms that breastfeeding is very good for uh, their health and their baby's health as well and the breast milk lower the risk of uh, having illness and uh, they don't have to clean bottles or pay uh, money for it during the clinic we help mothers to book uh, doctors and vaccination appointments and we follow up uh, with them. Uh, what we do is very helpful for mothers and babies and they are very happy having someone listening to them and helping them when they have any concerns. <laughs> Actually, because uh, they um, help refugees without uh, any money, and uh, we uh, they encourage mom uh, for breastfeeding, and uh, I breastfeed my children. So that was Leila also um, doing her work in the clinic. So I'm just going to sort of share with you now a week in the life of cheering, the kind of typical things we do. These are two of the camps that we go to, Scaramangas, which is actually closing. 3,000 people being sent all over the country. Um, and then Leonas, which is one of the camps we go to every single week, which is in the bottom right corner. Um, so these are the things we do when we're in the camps. We weigh and measure the babies. I mean, my goal when we started working with cheering was really to... Um, increase breastfeeding rates and in the shelter where we have um, a sort of captive audience if you like it's the same people we see every week and it's relatively small we have been able to do that but in the camps 
Um, it's almost impossible to track, frankly, breastfeeding rates. There's very little data. We're not allowed to keep the data from the refugees. Um, so we give them their own data. We do the growth charts and we give it to the mothers to keep. Um, but what we found was that moms want the babies weighed and measured. They want to know if the baby's growing um, and they want to know if the baby's gaining weight. So that is the bulk of what we do is we weigh and measure the babies. <clears throat> um, and this is a recent picture. This is a new camp that we started going to new for Oz, not new a camp, um, Malakasa One, which is about uh, 45 minutes north of Athens. And I was there about this, well, this particular picture was taken about a month ago, and this was the first time we went to Malacasa. And so you can see we have a very long line of moms and dads with their babies <clears throat> asking for them to be weighed and measured. And this we do in the car park so that we don't have to actually sort of get through security. The, the, the camp management is quite happy for us to do this outside, and we do it in collaboration with another young young <laughs> they're all young another group called food kind where very enthusiastic wonderful young people um, distribute food to mothers as well um, and then we also work at the elna maternity center which is right down the street from the cheering office it's run by a team from spain um, and it's one of the very rare shelters that offers housing for families with children and at the moment there are 88 people living in that shelter um, 45 of whom are children I um, mean, it's very well run, but as you can imagine, it's very crowded and very full. And if you spend any time at all there, as I do, um, on any given day, you will see families coming um, and being turned away because the place is full. So one day when I was there this last month, we had a family from Egypt who came and three young children under five and the mother was eight months pregnant um, and they could not house them. There was no space. People are living on the streets with young children. We train at other NGOs. This is um, a great NGO called Solid Solidarity Now, which is um, on the left-hand side of your screen. We They run the, ma the maternal child spaces in many of the camps. And we have a very enthusiastic group of young women who um, train with us. And then we also, if they have questions, like individual questions from the camps, then they can, um, they call us up and sometimes they put the moms into touch with our peer counselors so that we can do one-on-one -on -one consultations and that kind of thing. And then on the right side of the screen, this is when we went out to Samos. As I said, the conditions on the islands are very much worse than in the camps around Athens. And um, we did some training with some NGOs out there in Athens, that, in sorry, in Samos that um, work with moms and babies from one of those very um, overpopulated camps where people are basically camping all around the camp. They're not inside the camp because it's too full. Um, we do some special programs. This was chop, Shop and Chop Day at Elna. We went with all um, the moms to the local street market um, and we helped them buy what well, we bought for them. <laughs> Loads of vegetables and fruits, which some of which they had not been exposed to. There were quite a lot of the moms from Africa who had never um, seen strawberries before and then there were also many of the things that they did know but they didn't you know they didn't necessarily know they were available in Greece that some of the herbs that they were saying oh wow this is you know this is cilantro or something I get that in my country and when we were sort of helping them and it was a very nice experience that the, the community of street market sellers also was very um nice <laughs> friendly giving the babies carrots and things to chew on and um, it was just a really great experience so we do some things like that we also do infant massage classes um, one of our peer counselors is a physiotherapist in her country she did infant massage um, and we also working with another group uh, acupuncturists without borders which is doing um, trauma therapy um, physical therapy and reflexology with refugees who have suffered trauma and torture um, what we teach, as I say, is how babies grow and how they develop. Um, breast is best and empowerment of the mothers. And this um, picture here um, is one of the favourite handouts that we give to moms, dads about their babies. Um, you know, one of the things that we do, as, as I conclude this talk, one of the things that we do is really, <laughs> we're just nice to people. Like we really listen, we care, we're there for them and their babies, we talk to them. Um, as they get to know us, because we go regularly, they will tell us things, more um, intimate things about their children. Sometimes we have women that ask us for birth control. Um, and people are just sort of 
there's not much engagement for the people in the camp so they they like the engagement and one of their favorite handouts is this one because we always talk to them about how beautiful their babies are and we'll say oh he's five months old and he's already pushing oh oh they don't usually do that till they're six or seven months and look he's blah 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 talking and he's only four months old um, and that's usually what they do at six months of course we use this subtly to check like the baby that was paralyzed was eight months old and it couldn't I said I could tell there was something wrong with the baby uh, I was like okay just pop him down on the floor and we'll see what he can do and the mother said well I can't put him on the floor because he can't move his arms and then she said to me is that normal for a baby that's eight months old you know and in my calm <laughs> research trained way I said well no, you know, really, he should be able to do that by now. So let's refer him somewhere. So we referred him up through the system to get some kind of um, uh, assessment and stuff. But um, that was an eight month old. I had never moved. moved. Um, but, you know, most of the kids, amazingly, most of the kids are OK most of the time. Um, and so they really love looking at this handout um, and, and sort of saying, oh, yes, my baby can do that. My baby can do that. And they all go back smiling. And that's kind of you know, more than half the battle, frankly. Um, there are lots of things that we are not able to do. Um, can we really impact exclusive breastfeeding rates? You know, my, my big goal is always to do training and teaching because I personally and my team can't go and make everybody's breastfeeding rates increase. But um, I do, you know, try to spread the word and, and I would say like in solidarity now we have this sort of well, they've described themselves as this big group of breastfeeding advocates now um, so now they need more hands-on help because um, you know now they want to actually know how to increase the breastfeeding rate so that's kind of my long-term goal and that's how we hope to do that um, but really you know some of these agencies frankly need to get their act together because we have agencies from all over the world coming into Greece and running these camps and one would think and I won't name names but Agencies from Scandinavia, for example, that are running camps in Greece. In Scandinavia, the breastfeeding rate is like 99%. So why can't they um, pay attention to what's going on and train the people who work in the camp? It's not those individuals' faults, um, but you know, people are not aware of, of feeding and emergency strategies, regardless of where they're coming from. Um, and who is overseeing this at the international level? I mean, really, um, you know, Greece was considered a major crisis in 2015, but since then, many of the big agencies have pulled out. So it's really not so um, obvious whether there's a big picture strategy at all, frankly. Um, if in an ideal world, they need a proper needs assessment for infant feeding in emergencies, there needs to be collaboration with some of the wonderful Greek cl clinicians that I know that is a very strong um, IBCLC doctor group in Greece, Galaxias, and they are ready and willing but need to be brought in. There's always funding is an issue. Um, we need more trained volunteers and collaborators, more agency to train. Um, and our goal is to maintain and grow a steady, sustainable presence in Greece. So I hope you enjoyed that and um, we'd be happy to take any questions.